All right. Welcome to Worldwide Bible Class. I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. We are studying together the life of Jacob with Martin Luther. We're in Genesis 31, probably around verse 28 or so. To set it up, this is when, remember, uh, Jacob, 20 years, he's he's worked and slaved away for Laban. Laban has done everything he could to keep Jacob basically as a slave. And, uh, and he's finally got had enough. So he thinks, maybe I should leave. The Lord says you should leave. His wives say you should leave. So he's left and he's come all the way down to Gilead. So from way up north, all the way down to the, you think the east side of the Sea of Galilee and Laban charges after him to kill him, to arrest him, to enslave him, to steal the stuff. We, Laban's coming with him. on the way down. The Lord appears to Laban in a dream and says, don't touch him. Don't say anything bad about him. Laban's going to catch him. He's not going to touch him, but he is going to say bad things about him. And including, he accuses him of all these things, including stealing his idols. Now, it was Rachel who took away the household idols from Laban. And um, <clears throat> and but Jacob didn't know it. He didn't know that that had happened. So we got to, we got to, uh, we got to check that out, how Laban reacts to that. Now, I I have been astonished uh, how different Luther reads uh, this life of Jacob than anybody else. And I was thinking, I, so I was reading this week, this Knowing God by J.I. Packer for a, a number of reasons um, that are not maybe not that important. But I, I don't know, th this book I read when I was Hmm. How old was I? I was 19, still an evangelical. This book was, a, in fact, I think I took this book with me to Israel when I was backpacking around Israel. And I read this book over there and it, and it, it was astonishing. It was, it was an, it's like the, and I still remember the, you know, how I felt when I was reading it. Like, ah, finally I'm under, it was the first time I'd really engaged with theology, engaged with the scripture in that, in that level. But it's terrible. And I'll tell you why it's terrible. I mean, at the end of every chapter, it's it's a uh, at the end of every chapter, he he might get close to the gospel and mention some things that are very kind, but he just won't let it stand. He won't he won't let the gospel stay the gospel. He's all he's got to kind of pull it pull it back. I want to I want to give you an example. Um, so, so I, I mean, here's here's my at the end of chapter eleven. I have a note. Make sure you end with on a note of rebuke. So here's the second to last paragraph. Christians know that in addition to the word of God spoken directly to them in the Scripture, God's word has also gone forth to create and control and order things around them. But since the Scriptures tell them that all things work together for their good, the thought of God's ordering their circumstances brings them only joy. Christians are independent folks. They use the word of God as a touchstone, which they test the various views that are put to them. They will not touch anything, which they are not sure that the scripture sanctions. Well, that's great. That's right. That's nice. And then he says, why does this description fit so few people who profess to be Christians in these days? You will find it profitable to ask your conscience and let it tell you. He just won't let it be free. It's an amazing thing. Okay. Anyway, in this book, uh, Packer has a paragraph uh, or two about Jacob. And it's, it is the typical way that we read Jacob now, which is totally different from Luther. So I thought we could start by that and give us a contrast. So here's the page. Uh, this is, oh, page, this is knowing God page 94. So here Packer says, Jacob, and hopefully you guys can see me. All right. If, uh, see the, uh, see the screen share. I don't think I've done a picture like this before, but here we go. Jacob, Abraham's grandson needed a different treatment. Jacob was a self-willed mother's boy, blessed or cursed with all the opportunist instincts and amoral ruthlessness of a go-getting businessman. It, it just, so th th that's the kind of typical read of Jacob nowadays. It's so different than Luther, who sees Jacob as godly, sinful, but godly. Hmm. God, in his wisdom, has uh, had planned that Jacob, though he was a younger son, should have the birthright and blessing due to the firstborn, so became the bearer of the covenant promise. Also, he had planned that Jacob should marry his cousins, Leah and Rachel, become the father of 12 patriarchs to whom the promise was passed on. Okay, But God, in his wisdom, had also resolved to instill true religion in Jacob himself 
Jacob's whole attitude to life was ungodly and needed changing. Jacob must be weaned away from trust in his own cleverness to dependence on God. He must be made to abhor the unscrupulous double dealing which came so naturally to him. Jacob, therefore, must be made to feel his own utter weakness and foolishness, must be brought to such complete self-distrust that he would no longer try to get on by exploiting others. Jacob's self-reliance must go once and for all. With patient wisdom, God, uh, for God always waits for the right time, led Jacob to the point which he could stamp the required sense of impotent helplessness indeniably and decisively on Jacob's soul. It's instructive to trace the steps by which he did this. So th this is a th th this kind of read of Jacob is going to stand in stark contrast to the way that Luther is teaching us to to read. So anyway, thought I'd show you that as a as a foil. And now let's get to let's get to Luther. All right. Um. Ah, here we are. Now, last week we no two weeks ago. Last time we met. We did a, a lot of work on this idea here that Luther says, no nation was ever so stupid as to pray to wood, stones, gold, and silver from which the statues had been made. And we traced this idea through the large catechism, through Luther's, uh, through Luther's commentary on Jacob, uh, or sorry, on Isaiah, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the... So that's what we did last week. We tracked it down. But here, Luther's going to kind of lean into the same idea. They added the first table and supposed that God in heaven regarded for this worship, has regard for this worship. And here's the prayers made at the statue. Jeroboam is always going to be the chief example. Now, remember that Jeroboam, Jeroboam was the, uh, he was the ruler in the north when Solomon died. So when Solomon died, the kingdom was split north and south. So this is the year. 931 when Solomon died and the kingdom was split Rehoboam son of Solomon in the south Jeroboam in the north and Jeroboam decided that he couldn't keep the kingdoms divided if everyone was going down to Jerusalem and so he built an alternate place of worship two of them actually one at Dan and one at Bethel now Bethel was on the road into Jerusalem but Bethel is also the place where Remember, Jacob received the vision of the latter. So think about that. Now, this is an amazing thing. Uh, if Jacob, let me draw up. Let me just get a blackboard here. Uh, remember when, when Jacob is going to Bethel? Uh, that's about, when, when did we get the year for that? It's uh, Abraham is 18. So we're, we're thinking maybe. I don't know, let's say 1700 BC. I, th that's the wrong date. I'm just getting an example. Remember that David moves the capital to Jerusalem uh, in his rule, and David ruled from, from 1010 to 970, those 40 years. So let's say the year 1000 BC, the capital moves to Jerusalem. And now here's Jeroboam, Who's going to go back to Bethel? Someone's going to tell me on the chat of when the exact dates are. Uh, so Jeroboam moves to Bethel, and that's in the year 931 BC. And and look at when, when he says Bethel, he says, well, we've been worshiping here at Bethel for, for 800 years. Bethel is the real, Bethel is the true ancient place of worship. He, th this is where Jacob received the vision. We've only been in Jerusalem for, what, for like 70 years. This is the contemporary place, etc. We got to go back to the old school. We got to go so that Jer Jeroboam could argue the antiquity of Bethel. And that's what he does here. And, and that's what we, we got to be we we got to be really clear that that this argument for Bethel is a very tricky argument. So we see it here in First Kings, uh, and here's Jeroboam, and here's what he says. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold, and he said to the people, "You have you have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. 
So here's what he's trying to do. He's trying to prevent them going up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And this is the key thing that Luther wants us to not miss about this, that, that they know that these, these golden calves that he built are like 20 minutes old. They, they the calf is just a, the calf is a symbol of God, of the seat of God, of the throne of God. Not, it's not the calf that they're worshiping. The calf is a, is a, again, is a, is a, is a placeholder. And he said, one at Bethel and one at Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people went as far as Dan to be before one. So Dan is way up north. Bethel is down south. He also made temples on the high places and appointed priests from among the people who were not of the Levites, so unauthorized priesthood. And he appointed a feast on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah. So he did a, he did a, he made replica feasts so that the people could still feel like they're worshiping, uh, but without going down to Jerusalem to be politically drawn astray. Now it's, it's wise, it's wicked, but it's wise as far as it goes. But here's the point. He does not say these calves are a new God or these calves are Baal. No, these calves are the God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And it's the same thing that is, is declared whenever um, Aaron makes the golden calf. This is the Lord, Yahweh. He uses the divine name referring to the calf that's uh, made there so that so that the people aren't the people don't think that they're worshiping the the wood or the gold or the statue, but rather the God who is there behind it. Okay. He himself and the people knew that the calves, this is back to Jeroboam and Luther, which had been formed in this way, were not themselves that deity which had led the Israelites out of Egypt, but they believed that the worship of God at these statues was pleasing and acceptable. So we remember, and here's the point, that idolatry can be, a couple of different ways to get there. Number one, you can worship a false god. Number two, you can worship the true God in a false way. And that false way is an unauthorized way. The Lord did not authorize the calves. He did not authorize Bethel and Dan. He didn't promise to put his name there. He authorized the tabernacle. He authorized Jerusalem and the temple that's there. He did not authorize these other things. So, so that you can worship God in a false way, and that is also idolatry. It pleased the king, this is Jeroboam, to fashion this likeness because a bullock or a calf is a special material for sacrifices. So you could not have a more fitting image. Why the bull? Why the calf? Now, this is an interesting thing because, um, because, because we talked last week about how Baal likes to ride on a bull as a symbol of power. But Luther here says, that's not the idea with Jeroboam, at least not the chief idea. The chief idea with Jeroboam at Dan and Bethel is to, is to remind them of the sacrifice that's happening. And the, chief, the biggest sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice, is the sacrifice of the bull. So he has, the, let's make the bull, and that reminds us of the sacrifice. So he does not say that this bullock or calf is God, but he ties the worship of God to the figures of the calves, where prayer, worship, and sacrifices were to be offered to God. Therefore, this, the container is taken for the content by synecdoche, namely that God is to be worshipped in the calf, just as God has also promised to hear the prayer of those calling on him in the tabernacle at the ark and the mercy seat. So Jeroboam is going to say, well, God is... God is not in the temple. That's what Solomon said at the dedication. You don't live in temples made by hands. But he's promised to hear the prayers of the people calling on him at the tabernacle and the ark and the mercy seat. So also here. Now, this synecdoche is an old, I don't know, it must be Latin idea. And it means referring to the whole, uh, referring to the whole by the part. Uh, um. What, what I don't know an example like when you refer when you say Kleenex you mean tissue you're there's a a part of tissues or Kleenexes but you when you say clean you mean the whole thing that's an example or um 
uh, w- when you say, I- I'll take your hand in marriage. Well, you're not just marrying your bride's hand. You're marrying her whole self. But you say, I, that that's a synecdoche. You're, you're referring to the whole by the part. And here, uh, and, and this is, Zwingli loved to talk about synecdoche with the Lord's Supper. Um, a dictionary says that uh, 50, Mark says, dictionary says that 50 sails says 50 sh- uh, ships. That's right. Uh, Joe, oh, here's some, Joey says, the deception of idolatry, worshiping God in a false way. I believe this includes loving the gifts of God in place of God. Exactly. Uh, family skills, abilities, we replace those for God. We fear, love, and trust those gifts of God rather than the God who gives the gifts. We always got to see through the gift to the giver. Always, always. It's key. So, um, so that the synecdoche was put in place here by Jeroboam and saying, no, look, look this, this calf is a picture of the God who is merciful and who rescued us from Egypt. In this way, all the nations have retained the worship of their fathers and have adorned or rather perverted it by their idolatry. Uh, At Ephesus, there was an image of Diana in which men imagined a deity to be present that heard and received prayers. Now notice, and this is an amazing insight, and this, this will go through, even in our book of Concord, Philip Melanchthon will talk about this, this way of reading history, is that all of the worship of of all of even the pagans is a perversion of the true worship given by God in the garden to, to Noah, to Abraham, and so forth. In fact, there's a place where Luther will say all the, no, Melanchthon will say, all of the pagans who worship by, by child sacrifice, for example, learn that from Genesis, where the Lord says, uh, he will crush your heel, you will crush his head, that, that, that there will be the death of a person who will save the people. And that the devil perverted that preaching of the gospel into not the, into, it's not the Lord sacrificing his son, but rather we're sacrificing our sons. So that all the, all the pagan kind of worship is a demonic perversion of what the Lord has put in place. Now, this is an amazing thing because if we would look at like Greek mythology and and great as Diana, Artemis of the Ephesians, what Artemis must be her Greek name, Diana, her Roman name, uh, we would say, well, that's sort of the ancient worship. And here we have the new worship, which the Lord has given. But but the Lutheran fathers want to understand all pagan worship of all all places, all people to be a perversion of the original institution of worship from the Lord. And I think that's, I mean, it's great. And it's really good to think about. Laban, okay, back to Laban. Laban, therefore, accuses Jacob not of stealing gold or silver, but of robbing him and his church of their entire divine worship. So the accusation coming to, remember, he caught him and said, hey, you stole my idols. Jacob didn't know anything about it. Rachel had the idols. She was hiding them. To the extent that he could, the kingdom of heaven. That's what, that's the accusation that Laban is making against Jacob. For what else is robbing men of their religious life and their worship of God than to rob them of God himself, life itself, eternal salvation, to give up Satan, uh, to give them up to Satan and hell. This sin is so atrocious and abominable that can never be excused or expiated by any words or sacrifices. In other words, the thing that, that Laban is accusing Jacob of is stealing his faith. Stealing his worship, stealing the thing which matters the most to him. This is so. Not only have you have you taken my daughters and my grandchildren, you've also taken my salvation. So Laban is accused by Jacob. Now uh, Luther's not going to be very impressed by these charges. Uh, Laban exaggerates this in uh, in such a dramatic measure, not because of his regard for zeal or religion. Remember Laban, from the hints that we have in the text of Laban, he was some sort of strange superstitious uh, mix, syncretism. So he sometimes will talk about Jacob's God, sometimes talk about the Lord, sometimes he practices witchcraft. Now the Lord does appear to him in a dream, and he receives it half as instruction uh, 
he but he's mostly going to ignore it because the Lord in the dream says, don't speak against Jacob, and he's going to do it anyways. Um, so this is a really, oh, boy. Well, remember, there's, I mean, there's no love lost, lost for Laban from Luther. Uh, as though something had been taken away from salvation or the grace of God, but that he might heap on Jacob the envy and implacable hatred among his own relatives and brothers who perhaps knew that Jacob had been rather harshly treated and that uh, the chief factor in the increase of his household properly had been the, this faithful servant. So that Luther says, look, Laban is, is all these words, all these things are not for sake of piety, but rather for the sake of face. And it's dangerous when someone has lost face and Laban has lost face here. Remember, he has his kids with him, his sons who were on the, who were on the war path to get Jacob with him. So accordingly, that he might cover up Jacob's merits and his own greed and disgraceful cupidity, he gathers together whatever virtues there are in the first and second table and adorns himself with them. Now, this is going to be a very interesting insight into the into human psyche. And Luther's going to going to take this as a as a type of how the unclean conscience works. This is pretty amazing, actually. How this is going to go let me delete and move up here so that nothing may seem more holy according to the commandments of god than most holy nabal remember that he luther loves to switch his names uh, his reverses his, his uh letters and call him nabal uh, for the wicked man that david almost killed so he he plays this game all the time on the other hand he turns back all imperfections and heaps them on jacob when in reality he's seeking nothing else but gold and silver. So that all of the wrongs that he does, he accuses Jacob of, and all of the rights that Jacob has done, he sees on himself. So that, so that Laban accuses Jacob of all of Laban's sins, and Laban takes hold of Jacob's righteousness as if it belongs to himself. So today, and that that idea that and and we and we see the we just to see the shape of it. It's a it's a kind of reverse. Uh, it's a like a reverse um, uh, justification. Is it so? So we know that true justification is here's here's me and here's all my sin and death, and that and 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 all this and here's Jesus, and Jesus says. I'm going to take that, which belongs to you, and I'm going to take it and give it to. I'm going to. I'm going to bear it myself. And all my, all, all my, um, my dentist is calling, probably to tell me I'm supposed to be there tomorrow. Here's here's all of Jesus. Uh, here's all of Jesus' righteousness, and his perfection and his life, and he gives that. He gives that to us. This is what we call the great exchange. This is what uh th th this is what the Lord does in this is what justification is. This is true justification. But here the oh boy, they really are after me. Uh, but here's what the sinner does, and this is what he's gonna what Luther's gonna point out is that it's not taking my sin and death and putting it on Jesus. No, here's my enemy. And I'm going to put all the things that I've done wrong on him, and I'm going to take all of his good and take it for myself, so that rather than Jesus taking our sin and giving his perfection, I'm going to take my sin and put it there on you. And the end says gaslighting. I think that's it is a it's a gaslighting. It's a what the psychologists used to call. I don't know if they still talk about this today. A projection where I see all my own sin and guilt and shame on everybody else. But the idea is, and I think we've talked about this before, but this might be really interesting. It's, it, it's the idea that the conscience is like a window. So, okay. So imagine you're sitting inside and here's a window and, and that, and, and here's the stuff that's outside. Let me draw it. A tree. Oh, this is me. Boy, you guys, we could probably take this and put it on Etsy. The art here. Now, if the if the window is dirty, 
what happens? If the window's dirty, two things happen. Number one is I, I, the, I'm trying to look at this tree, but the tree looks dirty. The tree looks like it's got uh, film and and uh, muck all over it. And also the sun is shining in there uh, into the window, but it also looks dirty inside too. I remember one time I was vacuuming the floor in the living room and there was a spot and I was over this. I couldn't get the spot out. What's going on? So I got down on my knees and I was trying to poke in at the spot. And I realized that there was a probably bird poo on the window and it was a shadow. I was trying to clean up the shadow. So everything inside looks dirty. Everything outside looks dirty. And then what happens is I start to see on the window, the dirtier it gets, I start to see my own reflection there on the window. Uh, and I so I, I and I see that looking back at me. So that my own dirty conscience puts this filmy overlay over the whole world. So that what do I what do I see? I see everything outside looks dirty, everything inside looks dirty, and I start to see myself on all these things. Again, I think that's what the psychologists call projection, but this is the idea of a of the conscience as a dirty window. To the it says, um, where's this verse? I need to remember. It's in. I think it's in. It's in. It's it's either in. Uh, someone look it up. To the to the impure, all things are impure. It's either First Timothy or Titus or First John, but that's a a long either. And I should remember that verse. To the unpure, all things are pure. But to the pure, all to the impure, all things are un, to the unclean, all things are unclean. But to the pure, all things are pure. And that's the picture of the conscience as a clean window. Now, when you have a clean window, two things happen. It all here in the dirty window, everything is dirty. Everything is unclean all around. If I have a clean window, well, now I drew such a nice picture. I've got to, got to pick the colors again. Make it, does it, does it make everything look clean? No, it lets you see everything as it is. So maybe there is a little bit of, I don't know, maybe this leaf over here is unclean and maybe this spot over here is unclean. Well, I can see that it's unclean, but I can also see what's clean. Titus 1.15. There we go. I should, someone can remember that like this. So that the, to the, uh, to the clean, if you have a clean conscience, you can see things how they are. This is why the old Lutheran theologians used to always talk about the necessity of a clean conscience for doing theology. But here's so here you see an example of Laban. Whoops. You see an example of Laban who's trying to who's looking at Jacob and he sees in Jacob all of his own sins. He all, all of his own sins are piled on Jacob, and all of Jacob's righteousness is grabbing, is, 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 is he's taking for himself in some in some form of like anti, anti, anti-justification. I'm in, I impute your righteousness to me and I impute my sin to you. It's really, it's really bad. Now, um, so Titus, I got to write, I'm writing it down. Titus 115, Titus 115 to the unclean, all things are to the pure, all things are pure. Now, uh, uh, the question came here, Joe, is the conscience progressively clean? We want to remember that we have a clean conscience in two different ways. So our conscience is clean before God by the blood of Jesus. You guys got this picture? I'm going to do another one here. So the conscience, um, the conscience has a, if we think of our heart as the, so remember what the conscience is. The conscience is the, is the capacity for judgment that belongs to our heart, our inner life, the little throne room of the heart that's, a, and it's, and the conscience, this, this is a throne I probably don't need to tell you. You can tell, obviously, from the drawing. That's a throne. 
Uh, so the conscious and it's making judgments. It's making judgments on what I do to other people, what other people do to me, what other people do to other people, what's happening in the world. Uh, this is it's making these four judgments uh, about these things. And uh, and it's saying they're good or bad, clean or unclean, right or wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the conscience um, is made guilty because of sin, especially my own sin. But we have the conscience. Is it it's it needs to be clean in two different directions, and the conscience is clean towards God by the forgiveness of sins, by the blood of Jesus, by the gospel. You cannot have a good conscience before God by your own works, and this is not a progressive thing. It's an instant thing. Although we're constantly working on it, we're constantly hearing the Lord's mercy, and in that way, the Lord is constantly delivering to us a clean conscience because it's. You know, it wants to, it, it kind of wants that, the dirty conscience wants to creep up on us. And so the blood of Jesus has to come along and cover it and cover it and cover it so that the conscience is made clean by the blood of Jesus this way. The conscience is made good towards other people by our works and our vocation. Um, and that means our conscience will never be completely clean when it comes to other people. We, we'll always be because we never we can't do everything that we ought to do i mean it's an amazing thing you know i i wake up every day as a husband and a father and a pastor and i am called to love my neighbors myself which means carrie and the kids and the congregation and i can try but i will that i can never i can never be i can i can never have a hundred percent clean conscience there's always more that could have been done that's why we always are going before God for forgiveness. And it's always why this is why we're trying to work and love and serve our neighbor. So we're always that means there's always something, by the way, that you can hold against your neighbor if you want to. And that's why we have to live by forgiveness uh, with one another. That's why these all these one another passages in the Bible are so important that we have to forgive one another because we can always blast each other uh, for the sins that we commit. You can you, you you just know this. If you have a neighbor, they've sinned against you, and you can hold it against them if you want to be miserable and you or you want them to be miserable. So that's always an option for you. But that's why we have to live by mercy also in our in our vocations. So this is the and this is a progressive deal. And th this is where especially Luther talks about the comfort of the law because God has given us our vocations. And so when I do the things I'm supposed to be doing, as a husband and a father and a pastor, for example, then I can have a good conscience that this is what the Lord has given me to do. And even though I don't fill the shoes that the Lord has given me like I ought to, I know I'm wearing the right shoes. I've got the shoes that he's given on, etc. Okay. Uh, Jill says, remembering our baptism, according to first Peter's appeal for a clean conscience towards God. Yeah, that's right. That, this is what baptism is. So that the water of baptism, this, this red blood, is the water of baptism. B baptism brings the blood of Jesus. And, and, and notice this. These are supposed to be connected to one another. This is not accidental. That the forgiveness of sins, the gospel, gives me a clean conscience before God, and that sets me to love my neighbor in a different way so that I'm not trying to earn God's approval by my love for the neighbor. This, by the way, is why Paul can talk about having a good conscience, because he does what he's supposed to do. Okay. Now, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, Laban. I do not think we're going to get to the places where I wanted to get today. Uh, today, the papists boast in the name of the church that they want true... Oh, that's right. So this whole point is that the conscience is like a window and that you start to see your own sins on other people. That's exactly what Laban does. So Laban sees all of his greed and godliness on Jacob. <laughs> and he also sees all of Jacob's righteousness on him. Gaslighting is exactly right. Christ and uh, the papists want to have Christ and faith unimpaired, religion and obedience towards the laws and towards the church and the civil magistrate pure. Yet they worship and care for nothing but their belly. Accordingly, this is a striking uh, description of a notorious hypocrite, Laban, who boasts that he himself is the greatest of saints and overwhelms the excellent and holy man Jacob with every kind of abuse, outrageous crime, and deceit. 
and is one who should be subjected not only to human punishments, but to the torments of hell. So he's condemned. Laban is condemning Jacob. He calls him a thief, robber, kidnapper, housebreaker, unfaithful, ungrateful, sacrilegious, and a subverter of religion. That's the accusation from Laban to Jacob. He could not have traduced and reviled him more harshly. From this, it is sufficiently clear how Jacob stood with Laban. <laughs> in other words, if Jacob was wondering that he did the right thing in leaving, if Jacob was wondering if Laban was really a nice guy and a kind man, well, all of these accusations are going to help, help him know where he stands. Laban treated Jacob like a slave and in a shameful manner so that he abused him like a piece of property, or rather an ass or the vilest of beasts, for the acquisition and increase of his own holdings. Everything is, everything for Laban is about his own gain. It's what greed does. It turns your whole, you, 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 you just become a walking belly. Rah. Nevertheless, he paid him no reward but bread or water. Now in return, for his great industry and toils, he reviles him. Uh, he reviles him with the greatest of lying insults. Surely this is not obeying God, who forbade him to speak anything harsh against Jacob, is it? That's what God said in the dream that he gave to Laban. Hey, don't speak about Jacob. No, this is a most bitter thing to do, to charge him with all the crimes and sins that can be thought of and mentioned. But these matters are described for our instruction and example. For this is the perpetual rule of the ungodly. So Luther's now this idea of the conscience as a mirror, Luther's going to get into here. Uh, and he's going to have two rules of the uh of how the ungodly work. Christine has this verse is I've been thinking a lot about Christine is quoting Philippians 3 in 19 in the text. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, they glory in their shame, their mind is set on earthly things. That's exactly right. So here's the two rules of the ungodly. First rule, they obey God in appearance and confess him with words, but deny him in deeds and despise his commandments. So the hypocrite will say, yeah, yeah I'm a Christian. They'll say all the right things, but everything that they're doing is going against that. Here's, the, here's how Laban does that. Laban abstains from open violence. He doesn't lay violent hands on Jacob. If it had been permitted, he would not have spared him because he is all on fire with a desire to harm him. But the ungodly are humbled and kept in check by the fear of punishments. So they put on an appearance of repentance, but with a fictitious and deceitful humility, just as Laban did everything in pretense and secretly raged because he did not dare fulfill his desire for vengeance. So the first thing is the hypocrisy of the uh, uh of the godless they don't do they they don't do what they want to do they say the right thing to get their own way but it's all deceit now here's the second rule and this is the very interesting one uh all outrages which they are turning over in their own heart and wish to perpetrate they impute to the saints on the other hand all the things that the saints do and the virtues proper to them, they arrogate to themselves. So all my wrong goes on you. All your right comes to me. This is the universal rule of all hypocrites and ungodly men. This explains so much. Uh, if you, you know, been dealing with someone and, and they think that you're lying to them, or they think that you are out to get them, or they think that you are whatever, and those are that's not what you are. And you can't understand why, why they're seeing you that particular way. This is the nature of the of the heart to to put onto you or the unclean conscience to put onto you all the things that are wrong with me. Now we have to be very careful about this because. Sometimes, it, you know, if someone accuses you of, well, I, oh, I, I have to be careful about this too, but look, I'll, I'll give you an example when I think this happens. So um, there was, there was someone, I would, mm, yeah. I better, I, let me, I'll be very abstract about this. 
Uh, I was accused of, well, I become so abstract. I'm not saying anything. Yeah, I better just move on. But you can you can just imagine the times that this has happened when someone is accusing you of something that you didn't do. And it becomes an indication as that's the thing that's in their own heart. Now, what you can't do is take it as proof. But but you can't because it's a dangerous thing to accuse someone of something that, first of all, you don't know that they've done, et cetera. But this helps explain when whenever you're in these conversations that just don't make sense. Like, why are you mad at me? I'm not, I'm not doing this, this thing that you think I'm doing. I'm not doing. I'm doing the very opposite. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. What, what's going on? You to know that this is this, the bad conscience is a distortion field. So that when you're whenever you're in these conversations and it just doesn't, it's not computing. You know, you can know that you're dealing with a bad conscience and uh, and you're in dealing with spiritual warfare, too. Chris says, you can't win with the unrepentant wicked. You join them. They betray you. Eventually you don't. They see your sins in you and they hate you or they hate you for condemning their sins by not engaging them. Servants not greater than their master. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Lee says, the sin we see in others most clearly is very often the sin that we would like to do or that we are guilty of. Yeah, that's that. So it's also for us, too. That we when when we notice that we're we seem to be accusing people of something without proof that that's an indication of our own hearts. Okay. We've got to be very careful about this. Laban himself is an idolater. Uh, yes, it takes one to know one. That's that's, that's the <laughs> what's that that's what we always used to say. Um Laban himself is an idolater, a thief, a robber, a kidnapper, a greedy man, a pretentious monstrosity of the age. Yet to himself, he seems the most honorable and excellent of all men. He accuses Jacob, who's the very embodiment of innocence and honesty, and who's full of the most beautiful virtues and their remarkable consequences, which he brings forth for the advantage of the church, the state, and the home. But no one sins except Jacob, and no one is holy but Nabal. So that's the idea here. That's the... That's this wicked reversal that happens with a dirty conscience. These things are certainly uh, offensive uh, and undeserving, but they are written in a way so that by that we, by steadfast in the encouragement of the Scripture, might have hope. This is a second mention of Romans fifteen four, this important text, and Luther is and saying, uh, Luther saying, look, the, the, this is there for us. Amber says, we should be careful to first hear and examine ourselves and see if the accusation is just. I think we ought not to dismiss accusations too quickly to justify our own sin. Exactly. We, we are tempted to, the, to do the same thing. It's part of our sinful flesh. We, we are excusing machines. We are, where's this? I read this. Oh, I read too many. I read a bunch yesterday. And I, that's a problem when you read too much is you can't, um, you can't remember what you read. It's better just to read one page at a time. Uh, no, uh, that's not, uh, uh w- that we are, we are masters at, at justifying ourselves. Our capacity for self-deception is, is over the top. And, and so we, we, we have this kind of natural capacity to, 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 ju- to, well, what is it? What does it remember what the conscience does? It accuses and it excuses so that we are so that we are always trying to excuse, accuse others and excuse ourselves. That's the conscience that's not set free by the forgiveness of sins. So we have to um, we do have to think, do do I have I done this thing? Yep, that's 100 percent right. Uh, here's how this, um, here's how the guys, uh, how Luther sorts this out. No, this is what it looks like. No one sins in the world except the only begotten son of God. No one is righteous, but the devil. That's what the, that's how the conscience, that's how the dirty conscience, the hypocritical conscience inverts things. Whatever he, the devil says does is just and right. So the, and, and, but this is what exactly what happens in the garden. Remember what how remember how the devil deceived Adam and Eve. God knows that you won't surely die. In other words, 
God is the one who's lying and the devil is the one who's telling the truth. So the heretics and papists always arrogate to themselves righteousness, holiness, and wisdom as the ones who alone protect and defend the Catholic faith. But the true church bears this disgrace. It's heretical, strang, scandalous, seditious. It's the refuge and offscouring of the world. So that there's always this reversal happening. But since it seems thus good to God, and it cannot be otherwise, but that there should be a flock which for God's sake is refuse and a reproach of men and rejected by the people, we are certainly not reluctant to be regarded as such in the world, for we have his riches consolation, which God says, Blessed will you be when men hate you and when they cast you out and insult you and utter, utter your name like an evil omen on account of the Son of Man. I think that must be Luther's own uh, translation. Utter your name like an evil omen. Be glad. This is the last of the Beatitudes. Be glad on that day and rejoice, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. It's a matter of a short time. Life is This life is brief and wretched, but the joy, where's the joy? There it is. But the joy and glory we await is eternal. That's heaven. Since therefore it pleases God, and this is an amazing thing to me, that it that it pleases God that we should be a little flock. It's not like God in, puts up with us being a little troubled church. No, that's what makes God happy is for us to be a little troubled church, insignificant, despised. Let us bear the troubles of this life. In this life, you will have trouble with a calm and joyful heart. Look at that. Let me get a different color. With a calm and joyful heart. Just as Jacob bore reproach, abuse, contempt from the proud Labanites and hypocrites. This is, the Lord has determined it. The Lord has determined it. Um, this might be a good spot to stop. Let me see how far we are to the next ver. Oh, oh, let me get this one paragraph, and then Luther's going to have a long grammatical Paul uh, thing that we can probably skip over. But this might be a good spot. It's true we may be regarded as sacrilegious, as disturbers of religion and civil governments, and indeed the greatest sinners of all men alive, which was the accusation of the Lutherans. I mean, the Catholic Church said, "Hey, look, you're destroying orthodoxy." Uh, uh, Charles V said, hey, look, you're destroying the Holy Roman Empire. Look, and this is the, still the accusation of Luther by the Catholics. He was this big sinner. It'll not be difficult for us to bear these reproaches, and we will conquer because of our leader and Lord, the Son of God, who himself bore the same reproaches and conquers in all his saints. Especially think of Romans 16, uh, where he's the Lord will quickly crush Satan under your feet. Let us only let us, this is the key thing for us, not to, we're not trying to win the approval of the world. We're not trying to remember to win the approval of those who would be church, et cetera, et cetera. We are trying to win the approval of God. Let us be counted as Jacobites and not among the Labanites. And let us not be disturbed because the devil together with the ungodly hypocrites is regarded and worshiped as God is holy and righteous in the judgment of the whole world. We're not worried about this. We are worried about what God and his word say. And then if we are with the Lord Jesus, then it'll be all right. All right. This is a good spot to stop right here because th th there's a word that's here um, in the Hebrew, which is tricky. It's, it, it's, and Luther's going to say, I don't know exactly how to do it. It's when Jacob says, uh, um, I have the authority. Uh, I have the authority authority to yeah it is in my power to do you harm that word power is the hebrew word el which is what elohim comes from uh and it looks like it's a figure of speech but it's it's a tricky one and luther's going to spend quite a time on it. so this is a good spot to stop uh and i'll uh i'll say a prayer and then and then shut down all the uh, security measures so we can uh we can chat so let's pray oh lord we give you thanks for the wisdom that comes from your word. We pray that in the accusations of Laban against Jacob, you would show us how the sinful heart works against us and also in us. 
We pray that you would give us a good, clean, pure conscience by the blood of your son, Jesus, to stand before you on the last day and also that you would give us your Holy Spirit and wisdom so that we would serve our neighbors in our vocation and have a good conscience towards all people as well. For we ask this all for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace. Amen. <laughs>